Shalom, welcome to Jewish Christian Studies. In Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 15 to 18, he reminds us how Christianity is rooted in Judaism. And with that understanding of that letter that Paul wrote in the early history of the church, we founded in Vatican Council II, a document called Nostra Aetate, where the universal church reminded us of our roots in Judaism. And it was promulgated by Pope Paul VI on the 27th of October in 1967. Because of that, we've been having a series of lectures concerning Nostra Aetate held at the Conference Center at the Villa Maria Community Center in Villa Maria, Pennsylvania. We first in, brought in Rabbi Benjamin Bleck, who talked about the secrets in the Sistine Chapel that Michelangelo put into his artwork. Then Susan Tamark and Goodman came the next year and talked about the crucifixion scenes in Mark Chagall's paintings. And then we had a, the history of the violins of hope of those who were playing the violins as people were going to the execution chambers, the gas chambers in Auschwitz. That was presented by uh, James Grimes. This year we had Dr. Tom Crane speak about a virtual reality tour of the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem. And that was presented at the conference center also. And so at this time now we take you to the conference center and the presentation of Dr. Tom Crane. Good evening. And, and thank you for the invitation. Thank you also for your attendance this evening. Uh, what we're going to do over the course of the time that follows is I'm going to talk in terms of the Holocaust Museum at, uh, in Jerusalem, Yad Vashem, and to give you a little bit of an idea in terms of its overall significance on this very, very large campus on Mount Herzl, literally 40, nearly 45 acres. Uh, it stretches across. So we're going to cover some of, some of the areas in detail. We're going to narrate uh, as more of a walkthrough of the history of the Holocaust, which would be very, very similar to what you would be going through in the Holocaust Memorial Museum at Yad Vashem, as well as see a short film clip, et cetera, and then eventually I will open the floor for any questions that you uh, may in fact have. Well, to begin, you can see here this very large expanse at Yad Vashem. And it's Israel's official memorial to the victims of the Holocaust. It is dedicated to preserving the memory of the dead, honoring Jews who fought against the Nazis, honoring Gentiles who aided Jews in need, as well as researching the Holocaust in particular and genocide in general, with the objective of avoiding genocide in the future. Perhaps a way of simplifying things is to show the incredible danger of intolerance, which we see far too often over the course of 5,000 years of recorded history, sadly and tragically up to and including the present day. Well, established in 1953 in Jerusalem, the memorial consists here of seven major areas. Okay, we'll be talking about uh, one of them in particular in detail, and we'll be talking about the other areas too. First and foremost, the Holocaust History Museum, the Children's Memorial, the Hall of Remembrance, the Museum of Holocaust Art, the Valley of the Communities, as well as the International School for Holocaust Studies, and finally, the Hall of Names. Now, where I'm from at the National Catholic Center for Holocaust Education at Seton Hill University, just outside of Pittsburgh, we run a summer program. The center was started by two Sisters of Charity. One of them, Sister Gemma Del Duca, father just mentioned. Uh, she's lived in Jerusalem since 1975. She's a very dear friend of mine, along with Sister Mary Noel Kernan. And they began this program back in 1987. The encouragement here of Pope John Paul II, who stressed for Catholics the need to learn all they could about the Holocaust. And it was something on a very personal level, going all the way back to Catholic grade school in Milwaukee, my hometown, where we were taught in the 
aftermath of the Second Vatican Council by the Salvatore nuns, we learned all about the Holocaust. And they also would stress to us time and time again that we were different in the United States because we were Catholic and this was a Protestant nation for Protestant people. But we could follow here the example set by Jews in America of a focus of education for leveling the playing field. By the same end, we'd ask, I can remember Sister John Francis asking, why did this happen? She said, because they were different and it shows boys and girls the dangers of intolerance. It's something that's always stayed with me from childhood onward, something I've never forgotten. And as an undergraduate, I set off in terms of more and more of an interest in Jewish history in the 1980s, and I have to say now I'm more confused by it than ever, for it was something that most certainly should not have happened. Well, in 1989, the National Catholic, for, National Catholic Center for Holocaust Education began this Catholic Summer Institute at Yad Vashem. And the program brings educators from Catholic colleges and Catholic universities as well as high schools. You don't have to be Catholic to participate, but ideally we go after the Catholic high schools and colleges. And it's a three and a half week intensive study here at Yad Vashem, okay, in the International Studies Institute. Scholarships are available. If you're interested, see me after. Okay, I can talk, uh, talk to you about it more in detail. But what you have here at Yad Vashem, the single largest Holocaust Memorial Museum in the world, the second largest, ironically enough, is the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. The third is the Illinois Holocaust Museum Center and Education uh, uh, Complex in Skokie, a suburb of Chicago. And I would argue, stepping into today, that the impact that the Holocaust had, I would say that the United States was impacted more by the Holocaust, or the Shoah, Hebrew for annihilation, than any other nation in the world, okay? Certainly any nation in Europe, obviously second to Israel. But what we see and what we find as we move forward is you have this site, the second most prominent site in all of Israel visited more, the only other exception is the Western Wall or the Wailing Wall in city center in Jerusalem. And the museum receives over one million visitors, over one million visitors every year. But what I'd like to do to formally kick off is to put on a short film that'll give you a good overview of Yad Vashem. And then we'll step back in and we'll go through the museum itself. I'll narrate here as we're walking through to have a, a, a better idea. So we'll see this short film. It should only take about six, seven minutes or so. Sidur ze nirchash al yadi ba'ushvitz. תמורת חלק ממנת לחם היומית שלי. עם הסידור הזה עברתי כל מסע הייסורים. ואחרות מוות בריכוז בגרמניה. את הסידור הזה הנה תורם היום ליד ושם למסגרת לדורות הבאים. As the Jewish people's living memorial to the Holocaust, Yad Vashem, on the Mount of Remembrance in the eternal city of Jerusalem, safeguards the memory of the past and imparts its meaning for future generations. A world center for commemoration, education, documentation, and research of the Holocaust. Yad Vashem today is a dynamic and vital place of intergenerational and international encounters. When the war ended, many believed that the memory of the Holocaust would act as a deterrent. To our sorrow, violent hatred, and even Holocaust denial are still a daily reality. <laughs> The website acts as an essential tool for reaching out to millions of people worldwide with materials in more than 18 languages and easy access to its online databases. The website enables Yad Vashem to harness technology in the service of memory. Thank <laughs> you. 
שקלתי את אבא, אך באמא. שאלתי סחי, אחי, אחי, אני חוזר למשפחה. זה מה שהימנים הם אך שמם בזכרו עוללו לנו. וזה דברים שאסור לשכוח. מצד שני, יש לנו נקמה שדרכים נרגשות על שרידים. זה אחר כך אנחנו נגדל משלחות, משלחות לתפארת. אני במהר. וזו הנקמה והנחמה. The journey through Yad Vashem is one of stark contrasts between suffering and hope, hatred and compassion, indifference and action in the face of death. At Yad Vashem, we are reminded we always have a choice. With programs that reach every corner of the globe, the International School for Holocaust Studies promotes a dialogue between our past, present, and future. If only Yad Vashem was here for the names, then Yad Vashem would be the spiritual final resting place of those victims. The fact that with that there is the museum and there's the education and there's the research and there's all the layers that go on top of that makes Yad Vashem absolutely unique in the world and it is the place where Holocaust remembrance and education and research really emanates from. Each year, thousands of educators and students from around the world participate in initiatives geared toward infusing the memory of the Holocaust with content and meaning. The Holocaust was unique to the Jewish people, but its significance as a crisis of human civilization continues to resonate worldwide. The director who has over in the Malach Museum has made a very important experience נדמה לי שהערך העיקרי שאדם יכול לצאת הוא לראות את עצמו כבעל מחויבות גם לקהילה וגם לערכים האנושיים האלה. תודה רבה לישראל שהיא מנהלתה מנהלת שאני חושב שהיא מנהלת לישראל אבל לישראל. C'était le murmure des âmes innocentes. Je me suis dit alors que sans doute c'était cela la politique. Faire barrage à la folie des hommes en refusant de se laisser emporter par la folie des hommes. J'ai changé à Yad Vashem. The international recognition of Yad Vashem for its promotion of peace, tolerance and coexistence would not have been possible without the unwavering support of our friends around the world. Millions of pieces of evidence safeguarded in Yad Vashem's archives stand forever as an accurate and detailed historical record of the atrocities committed against the Jewish people. My last will, Geller Zachstein. I wish to say goodbye to my friends and my work. I donate my work to the Jewish Museum to be founded in the future, to learn about the terrible tragedy of the Jewish community in Poland during the war. Be well, my Jewish people. Never allow such destruction to happen again. If you'll take away from our people the memory, we shall not have a future. If you'll take away our heritage, we shall not have a vision. And we need a memory and a future, a heritage and a vision. Drawing on the memories of yesterday, Yad Vashem aims to protect the values of mankind, strengthen commitment to Jewish continuity, and educate future generations. There are many museums that you are sad in the world that the source is here. This is the heart, and this is the soul of Jewish memory.
Okay, well, what I would like to do is to talk in terms of the, the central building, the main building, which is the Memorial Museum. And we will talk in terms of like an actual narration, but before we get into it, I want to uh, stress it will be going through the museum, okay, and I'll be narrating in terms of the chronology uh, uh, of the event itself, and then we'll start looking at the larger complex uh, over the course of this uh, a very, very large area, the different buildings uh, uh, and those sorts of things. Well, to formally begin, for the mass murder of the European Jews to have taken place, we need three central elements, okay, three central elements, three commonalities. If any one of these three are in fact not there. And if they are not there, the Holocaust would not have taken place. The Shoah would not have occurred. The first, right out of the gate here, is a legacy of Christian anti-Judaism. What concerns me most as a modern Jewish historian and as a Roman Catholic is the fact that Christianity should have been the greatest protector of its sister religion of Judaism. Not only does Christianity fail to protect its sister faith, at times it also becomes its greatest persecutor. I would argue it's something that Christianity is still, in fact, formally trying to come to grips with in the present state. Second of all, you need German defeat in World War I, a war that would take the lives of 15 million people from 1914 to 1918. Germany's defeat in World War I would open the gates here towards this historic scapegoating of the Jewish people, although the Jewish population in Germany was very, very small. In a nation of 80 million people, it was only about 500,000. Yet having been scapegoated for centuries, as we shall see, this campaign that would begin against the Jews really in the 1920s, but especially by the early 1930s, would be a direct result here of Germany's defeat in World War I and a looking or a searching for a scapegoat. And third and final, Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler and the Nazis. We will see over the course of centuries of anti-Judaism and centuries of anti-Semitism, we will see time and time again this hostility towards the Jews. Pogroms will be sweeping across Eastern Europe in the 19th century. But what sets here, what sets the Germans off this supposedly civilized and cultured nation, what sets Adolf Hitler off, makes him distinct, makes him different, is mass murder. That was something that had not been thought about in terms of an assembly line here of death. Without any of these three historic ties or foundations, the mass murder of the European Jews would not have occurred. Well, what we have here is oftentimes referred to as the longest hatred. 2,000 years, this isn't something oftentimes I would say to my students over the years at the University of Wisconsin in the Holocaust class. I wouldn't say it wasn't as an example of many people see it as 1933 to 45. They weren't even the Germans, they were the Nazis. And they arrived here, they hated the Jews, and for 12 years they killed nearly 6 million of them, and then it was over and they were gone. For this to have taken place, you have this legacy of 2,000 years of the scapegoating here of a group of people. And when we formally begin at Yad Vashem, in the main museum here, the main memorial, when you're entering here, this museum, and this part was opened in 2005, you're meant to feel uncomfortable. You're meant to feel very enclosed in terms of the architecture. And what you do when you enter here, you could easily spend in this museum alone easily three hours, is you can't go straight, you can't go from one end to the other. Rather, you have to enter in these slanted walls, you have to go around, you perhaps can see some of the cables there, you have to go around, back and forth, weaving your way all the way through. It gives one a sense, consciously and unconsciously, in terms of entrapment in terms of not really being that not everything is in fact right without even looking at anything. The image is indeed here spectacular and very, very effective. Well, as you move on through here the memorial, 
You'll see different aspects. In some cases, there'll be films. In some cases, there'll be placards. You'll see, uh, as well, once you get into the Holocaust itself, uh, uh, garb of the camp inmates here in concentration camps, as well as death camps. <coughs> And it is an experience that will go all the way back, all the way back to the start of this anti-Judaism. One of my favorite statements in terms of anti-Semitism, which makes absolutely zero sense, is anti-Semitism is due to two things, the Jews and the bicyclists. You say, well, why the bicyclists? The answer to that is, why the Jews? the stupidity of it all, the darker side of human beings, as we see coming to the surface far too often in human history. We'll go all the way back here to the Roman Empire, back to historic Judah, what the Romans referred to as well at this time as Palestina or Judea. And what we have is the birth of the sister religion of Christianity. And our first of three foundations this historic Christian anti-Judaism. From the standpoint of the Jews, it's imperative to realize very, very few Jews were looking here for a Messiah. There was the Pharisees, certainly, but in the writing of the Pharisees, there is nothing that talks of a Messiah, this anointed one, who is going to die to cleanse the world of original sin. From the Jewish perspective, the Messianic figure would be much more Bar Kokhba a hundred years later as opposed to Jesus of Nazareth. Well, this small group of Jewish followers, these Nazarenes, as they would know, be known as, would say that this was bigger. This was bigger. This would be the perfection of Judaism. Here in this area of chaos, of turbulence, especially in this region of the Roman Empire where the Romans were ruling here, this area with an iron fist through and through. Well, what we see is frustration on the part of the Nazarenes eventually becoming the Christians that the mass conversion of the Jews did not take place. And what happens instead is this transition, this transformation among some Christians of the Jews as Christ killers, the Jews and their attitude of murderers of God. What does it mean to be a murderer of God? Take, moves, removes all moral pretenses. What it does is it sets the stage for centuries to follow. The Jews will be thrown out of their historic homeland where they had been for a thousand years by the Romans in the aftermath of a series of revolts. Christianity, by comparison, will spread, though it takes a good 300 years with the Emperor Constantine in 312 and his conversion with this mystical vision that he has. Christianity becomes the official religion of the Roman Empire. And even by the time of the fall of the Roman Empire, Christianity is this massive, very, very significant religion. Well, in the centuries that follow, when we enter the Middle Ages, for as long as there was a Jew practicing his religion in some godforsaken town or some godforsaken hamlet, it cast here this glimmer of doubt that perhaps Christianity wasn't the one and only religion. And we see here this hostility towards the Jews in medieval Europe, especially around the time of Easter, when Christians would hear the passion and death of Jesus of Nazareth. And certainly Jews were not put in a good light. And it would lead to eventually homicidal anti-Judaism in the form of the Crusades in 1095, which would unleash the greatest catastrophe of all in, on the Jews here. Thousands of Jews were murdered by Christian crusaders and other Christian mobs before they even left off to gallop off here to capture the Holy Land and put it in the right hands of the rightful owners and take it away from the Muslim infidel. When we get to the 1300s, the Black Death, this extraordinary scourge, is going to befall Europe. And initially Christians believe God is punishing us because we are a sinful and wicked people. However, as 30% of the population is going to die across all of Europe in the first three years. By 1349, Christians who represent 99% of the population of Europe, the Jews are less than 1% of the population here in Europe, believe something more sinister is at work. 
What more sinister, what is in fact here formally at work, it is the Jew who's poisoning our drinking supply. They have no clue that's being carried by rats. This terrible, terrible disease. It leads to a second example here, a second wave of homicidal anti-Judaism or anti-Semitism. When we carry onwards into the 1400s, from the Jewish perspective, the attitude is one of we have to wait for the clouds to pass. We have to wait for the storm to pass. If we fight back, we're going to make it worse for all of us. We don't have safety in numbers. We have nothing. Well, in the 1400s, it becomes even more bizarre. As European Jews are accused here of ritual murder or blood libel, that they would, ca they would kidnap Christian children and drain their blood for these Jew sacrifices. It was particularly big around the time of Easter, which corresponds, of course, with Passover. Keep your eyes on your children. So any time here you had children who went missing and were found dead, beginning in particular in 1476 with Simon of Trent, as well as a follow-up, an unsolved murder mystery, Andrew of Wren. Jews would be arrested and tortured on the accusation of ritual murder, a complete and total myth, something that would follow the Jews of Europe all the way into the 20th century. But with the onset of the Reformation, which will be marking the 500th anniversary this coming October, October 31st, 1517, Martin Luther is going to introduce, in essence, this new form of Christianity. He had no intentions of breaking away from the historic Christian church, the Catholic church. He wanted reforms within the church, reforms that he saw were much needed. Well, Pope Leo here is going to excommunicate this professor of theology from the University of Wittenberg in the Germanic states. And Luther, therefore, has no choice but to start his own religion, and hence the Protestant Reformation begins. From a Jewish perspective, this might not be altogether all that bad. Because certainly things had not gone well with Catholics or with Orthodox Christians, maybe with Protestants it would. And indeed, in 1523, Martin Luther is going to write, Jesus Christ in the Jewish faith, also known as Jesus Christ was born a Jew. And in this pamphlet, he predicts the mass conversion of all the Jews to Protestantism, the one true religious faith. In fairness to Luther, he should have done his homework. Because the Orthodox Christians have been trying it for centuries. Catholics have been trying it for centuries. The Muslims have been trying it for centuries. Not a lot of luck. Well, what happens here is the mass conversion that Luther predicts doesn't happen. And in 1543, Martin Luther writes the most anti-Semitic document ever in the course of human history on the Jews and their lies. He encourages good Protestants to do whatever you want to the disgusting Jews. Burn their Torah scrolls, burn their synagogues, force them all to live in barns so they get in touch here with their inferior natures. Well, unfortunately, the relationship with this new form of Christianity is not going to improve matters, not much at all. As the centuries progress and the Middle Ages formally come to an end, we enter into this period in the 16th century of the Enlightenment, this awakening. And from the approach here of Christianity, this whole attitude of the Jews as Christ killers, the Jews as ritual murderers, that's medieval. That's obscurantist. That's passé. And it seemed as though there was this hope for a dawn in a new relationship. Christian anti-Judaism with the onset of the Enlightenment is going to begin a period of decline. Unfortunately, however, the framework will be used as Christian anti-Judaism is going to morph here into modern anti-Semitism. Modern anti-Semitism, with its birth in the 19th century in the nation of Germany. The exact decade, the 1870s. What do I mean by modern anti-Semitism? The Jews and their love of money. Money and power. Anything a Jew can do to get his hands on money, he's going to do it. Controlling the media. Controlling governments. This is a joke. This is pathetic, obviously. You have here a population 
1% of the population of Europe is so strong, is so powerful. Well, the problem here in capitalist society is with the onset of the Industrial Revolution. When the economy was good, everything was okay. When the economy of Western Europe took a turn for the worse, the Jews would be collectively blamed. The hope here was for assimilation. The hope was that if I'm a Jew living in France, I'll be looked as a Frenchman or French woman who practices a different faith from mainstream society, which was Catholicism. Western Europe seemed enlightened. Unfortunately, that did not appear to be the case. Eastern Europe, you still have this guttural anti-Semitism, the Jews as Christ killers in the Orthodox Christian world, the Jews as ritual murderers, to the stage that it will usher in across here historic Europe, in particular across the Russian Empire, wave after wave of pogroms. A new word is ushered into the Russian vocabulary. This carries us all the way into the early 20th century, into the city of Kishinev in 1903, where 49 Jews are going to be murdered on Easter weekend in Kishinev in this historic Russian province of Bessarabia. You can see here fathers holding their children who were among the murdered. And the atrocities that were committed here along with nearly 200 Kishinev Jews in 1903 who were seriously injured, it was a sense of outrage coming across Western Europe and the United States. Teddy Roosevelt was president of the United States at that time. What the hell is going on in Russia? This is the 20th century, for God's sakes. Why is this happening? The Russian government was put on the defensive at every front. From the perspective here of the Jews in Western Europe who had been looking in Western Europe to assimilate after thousands of years. You have the birth of this movement of Zionism. Now actually Zionism began in the historic Russian Pale Settlement. But the East European Jews who made up the vast majority of the population, they were very, very poor. These poor farmers living in Eastern Europe trying to eke out an existence. They were experiencing homicidal anti-Semitism coming from the Russians. The search, this quest for a Jewish state, a Jewish homeland, the lovers of Zion, these organizations, to go back from where the Jewish people had once been, because the attitude with this Jewish nationalism is the reason we've been used and abused for centuries is because we no longer have a homeland. And until we reestablish that homeland, there is no hope for us. Theodor Herzl will be the prominent voice here of Zionism. And in 1894, he will publish, born in Budapest, Hungary, lived the better part of his life in Austria, in Vienna, he will publish Der Judenstadt, in his native language of German, where he stresses here this need for a Jewish state in 1894, as the pogroms were continuing well before, well before Kishinev in 1903. And he stressed in 1894, that unless there is a Jewish state in existence somewhere in the world within 50 years, I fear the annihilation of the Jewish people of Europe. 50 years later, 1944, there is no Jewish state. In fact, it's the apex of the Holocaust. So you have here this first, this longest hatred. Well, our second foundation, Christian anti-Judaism, which morphs into modern anti-Semitism. Our second foundation is World War I. Germany, a nation that comes into existence only in 1871. Germany here is basically out to show the British and the French, the two great European powers, that it is the new power. And with these entangling alliances that have been established in some cases as far back as 1884, you have this great war. A war that would take the lives of 15 million people, making it the single most destructive war in history up to that time. Well, the hope here on the part of the Jews was that the 20th century would finally be a time of assimilation in some way or some 
way, shape, or form, or the birth here of a Jewish state of Israel. There has to be a light at the end of this tunnel. Take into consideration the following fact. In the 20th century alone, for every two Jews who have been born, one of them has been murdered. What does that say about the darker side of human beings? Think about that. And with the mon modern anti-Semitic theorists coming overwhelmingly from Germany, from Austria in the late 19th century, they would argue the Jew is deviant. He or she may look like a human being, but it's what's inside, it's what you cannot see that makes them so dangerous. This dehumanization, which became so very, very important. Germany a very autocratic nation would end up on the losing side of the First World War. And on November 11th, 1918, with the signing of the armistice, the war formally comes to an end, and as far as the Germans were concerned, we didn't lose the war. We've been told the entire war we were winning. Not one Allied soldier ever set foot on Deutschland. We did not lose this war. Rather, we were stabbed in the back by an international conspiracy. Well, this international conspiracy is going to consist in large measure by the early 1920s of less than 1% of the population, the Jews. The Jews of Germany will be singled out and blamed. And with this economic instability over the course of the 1920s, the stage will be set for the rise of Adolf Hitler, our third foundation here necessary for the mass murder of the European Jews to take place. Adolf Hitler. What has perplexed many Hitler biographers is why he was such an anti-Semite. It's something from people who knew him even back in grade school in Austria that even then he was a rabid anti-Semite. Why wasn't exactly clear. It's something he will carry with him throughout his entire life. Well, what happens is with Germany in the 1920s, it is going through a time period of out of control inflation by 1923. To give an example, it took 7,000 German marks to make up one American dollar. To put this in perspective, in Munich, to buy a loaf of bread in 1923 look, took literally a wheelbarrow heaped full of German marks. Germans who were living on fixed incomes were utterly ruined. But it was a way here of the victims, basically, this isn't your fault. This isn't the fault of the government. This isn't the fault of these reparations that we're paying here to the allied nations of Britain and France. Rather, it is simple. It is because of the Jew, the source of all the problems here in historic Germany. Now, certainly not all Germans accepted this. In fact, I would argue that the majority of them did not. Most of them were silent which that day and age as well as this day and age is not the answer in terms of dealing with extremists, certainly not. And what happens in the German Reichstag with the onset of the Great Depression, the United States tumbles headlong into it, Germany tumbles second, Germany suffers the second most only to the United States. In this 310 seat German Reichstag in 1929, the Nazi party had a total of 12 seats. The next year, 1930, they had 107 seats, making them the single largest political party in all of Germany. Adolf Hitler becomes chancellor of Germany on January 30th, 1933. And what he sets off to do here is he sets off immediately in a step-by-step -step process of going after the Jews. It's very subtle, at least initially, and he'll slowly keep pushing the envelope, slowly keep building this up. The Enabling Act of 1933, it had suspended the German Constitution in the interest of national security. And you will have this massive anti-Jewish boycott across all of Germany. Many German Jews began packing their bags and leaving. They'd been citizens of Germany for generations. They saw no future. It would be carried on, continued on, with all sorts of anti-Jewish laws and decrees. And in September of 1935, the Nuremberg Laws were passed, which really summed to summarize, Jews are not German citizens, and therefore they have no rights whatsoever. 
The dress rehearsal for the mass murder of the European Jews took place on November 9th and 10th, 1938, the Kristallnacht. On this night of homicidal anti-Semitism, the first pogrom in Western Europe since going all the way back to the Middle Ages. German mobs here are going to attack Jewish homes, Jewish businesses. They're going to burn Jewish schools, synagogues across the supposedly civilized and cultured nation, all across the nation. Over 100 Jews are going to be murdered on this night of broken glass. 30,000 Jewish males are going to be rounded up and placed in concentration camps in Germany at Dachau, Buchenwald, and Sachsenhausen following the Kristallnacht. As the 1930s progressed, there was more and more of a concern here of what the future would hold for historic Europe. On January, I'm sorry, September 1st, 1939, Germany launched an all-out invasion on the nation of Poland. And World War II effectively began. Now the Allies at the start of the war would be Britain, France, and Poland. Eventually here the Allies would be joined by the Soviet Union and the United States along with many other nations. And what you have here is a sense and the evidence of this is overwhelming, and I'm not just saying this as a Holocaust historian. Adolf Hitler, Adolf Hitler saw himself fighting two distinct wars. A war against the Allies, a war which he had as German Wehrmacht, the German army, to carry out these military campaigns. And a second war, a war against a defenseless civilian population, the European Jews. And for his war against the Jews, he had the SS and the Einsatzgruppen, who were going to be trained exactly in terms of what their responsibilities were and go indeed going to be, and volunteered for it overwhelmingly. In the backdrop of the Second World War, Hitler's Germany came closer in this land of Bach and Beethoven closer than human beings have ever come to creating hell on earth. And what you have with the invasion of Poland, which had the largest Jewish population in all of Europe, 3.2 million Jews in 1939. Six years later, less than 100,000 were still alive. What you have here first was the rounding up of the Jewish population and being placed here in ghettos. In the Warsaw Ghetto alone, and put on a starvation diet, in the Warsaw Ghetto alone you had 500,000 Jews living, cramped together here. Starved on a routine basis by the German High Command. Wherever the Wehrmacht went, the SS would follow, rounding up the Jews. And from the standpoint of the Jews, it didn't make any sense. I mean, this is the 20th century. What are they going to do? We're being told we're being sent to labor camps, etc. Well, with the onset of the invasion of the Soviet Union on the part of Germany, Poland falls, France falls, England or Britain is left standing, holding on. On June 22, 1941, Germany launches an all-out invasion of Soviet Russia. Any good Nazi hates communism with a passion, and such is the case with Hitler. If you want an actual date of when this began, I would say June 22nd, the Holocaust, June 22nd, 1941, and the first major victims are Soviet Jews. Had the opportunity in March to travel off with Father Dubois of Georgetown University. We did a, jo a, a joint tour with Seton Hill students and Georgetown students, and we went off to these mass graves. He's off, he's identified 1,400 graves over the course of the past 15 years. And he's able to tell in terms of how many corpses, because the rule of thumb, because the casings are in, you can tell with metal detectors, the rule of thumb was one bullet for every Jew. And you have here what was estimated to be 1.5 million Jews. Dubois is coming up with numbers closer than 1.8 million. And in these huge burial pits, Baba Yar, you have 35,000 Jews who were shot dead and buried in this mass ravine outside of Kiev 
in September of 1941. We went to two new graves in March. Each of them had about 1,000 Jews. And there were eyewitnesses. There were boys at the time speaking through interpreters and talking about this and stressing that after the action was carried out, A-K-T-I-O-N, as the Germans referred to it as, dirt was then put over this mass grave and the ground would move for two to three days longer. It was a very difficult experience for these 18 to 23 year olds. Quite frankly, it was a very difficult experience for me as well. It was not uplifting, not by any stretch of the imagination, but as the students would say, it was life changing. The brutality of it all. What you have here is this is also documented with the onset here is an Einsatz group and man, you can't actually see the full picture. It's a woman carrying her child or being executed. Just to the right of them is uh, four or five other corpses, probably all from the same family. The Germans kept detailed documents, 60 million pages on the Holocaust and on Jewish communities, how many Jews were there, how many were executed, etc. But the Germans wanted something more efficient. And this is something as well that Yad Vashem in the timeline chronology is going to go through in detail. They set up here death camps exclusively in Poland. These death camps here and the objective was to kill, you could kill 250 Jews, Jewish men, women and children about 20 to 25 minutes in these gas chambers. Okay? They were disguised here as showers. And at one gas chamber in Auschwitz, this human slaughterhouse of Auschwitz, one gas chamber could hold over 2,500 people. And they could be killed here in 25 to 30 minutes. This assembly line of death that the Germans perfected, along with countless other Europeans who also joined in knowing full well what they were doing. There were over 300 major concentration camps but you have here are the major death camps all located exclusively in Poland. And what happens is that even as the war turns against, even as the war turns against Germany, following the Battle of Stalingrad and Germany's defeat on January 31st, 1943. Certainly it was over, over, over in the successful D-Day invasion of June 6th, 1944 of the United States, Britain and Canadian troops soon to be joined by free French troops. This mass murder of the European Jews intensified. It didn't slow down. It's almost the attitude of the part of Hitler and his henchmen, if he was going down, he was taking the Jews with him. Nearly 70% of the Jewish population of Europe will be destroyed within six years. Well, as you're going through this experience here of the memorial, it is also imperative to see I think it's most important as a modern Jewish historian. Oftentimes they'll say modern Jewish history is one of the most depressing histories you can uh, uh, study, certainly. But there's also a sense of hope. The triumph of the human spirit. And when you leave this memorial of horrors at Yad Vashem, you come out at the very end, looking at this beautiful expanse of Israel. And a sense here of hope, a sense here of very strong hope for future generations. And it's something that becomes and remains absolutely imperative. Well, here on this great expanse, on the grounds, there's many other areas too that really have this huge impact. The Hall of Names, which is a memorial to the six million Jews. There are a total of 600 photographs of the victims as well as fragments of testimony pages. The 
is an art gallery. An art gallery that houses the largest collection of artwork produced by Jews and other victims of Nazi oppression going all the way back to the German Jews in 1933. Covers this period, this 12 year period, 1933 to 1945. There are over 10,000 pieces in this collection. Special ex exhibitions. The special exhibitions here. Uh, most recently Yad Vashem had one, this is this on, on children and children's dolls, as well as their artwork as well. It's a completely different entity, a completely different unit here at Yad Vashem. A visual center. There's one of my great heroes as, as uh, 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 just ends up being. Gerda Weitzman. She lives now in, uh, um, she's in Arizona. In fact, I, I saw her in Scottsdale, Arizona, two years ago. Um, and she survives. She's a Polish Jewish girl who survives here. She spends the better part of her life uh, following liberation in Buffalo, New York. One of her liberators uh, she ends up marrying. Phenomenal. My all-time favorite. The best documentary ever. I don't care whatever has aspect of history you're talking. It's called One Survivor Remembers. Okay. Can't locate a copy of it, I've got a ton of them. I'm more than willing to uh, mail one to you. It's a 40-minute film, won the Academy Award for uh, Best Short Documentary some years ago. Talking about her experience in this 40-minute film. Well, the Visual Center has a huge amount of film footage, documentaries, as well as this visual center which you go to is different historians talking about different aspects in terms of knowledge, in terms of trying to big, wrestle with the bigger issues here of the Holocaust. Some theological, some historical, some political questions. Have we learned from anything? Can this happen again? So on and so forth. Those sorts of issues. The Hall of Remembrance. The Hall of Remembrance. Here you have, in fact, here's Pope Francis from a few years ago. Okay. They have, as you can see on the floor, in uh, one of the most somber places at all here at Yad Vashem of the death camps of the Second World War. You have as well the eternal flame. And it's something that, as a Roman Catholic and a modern Jewish historian, to me, he's one of my great heroes. What he has been doing as well for Jewish Catholic relations, which is what we are focused on here in our National Catholic Center, has been extraordinary. I hope he's around for a good long time. It's kind of a Francis groupie, I guess you could say. <laughs> well, here at the Hall of Remembrance, in fact, his closest friend is the chief rabbi of uh, Buenos Aires. Okay? They, they co-wrote a book together not too long ago. Janusz Korczak. If you get off into the area here of the Valley of the Communities, okay, and they'll have all the different towns and, and villages and cities that were just leveled. Okay. A very, very moving outdoor area. There's also countless statues. Okay. And there's an avenue of the righteous that honors here hundreds, thousands of righteous Gentiles who stepped in, putting their own life on the line to rescue Jews. It's not just people like Oscar Schindler and Raoul Wallenberg. It's your average Joe off the street who most people know very, very little about, who did the heroic thing, who did the just thing. Janusz Korczak, one of my great heroes of the Holocaust. Janusz Korczak was in the Warsaw Ghetto. He oversaw here an orphanage. And when it came time to deport here, as they were liquidating the ghettos and sending the vast majority of the Warsaw Ghetto Jews, ended up gassed at Treblinka which was the most efficient of all the killing centers. Korzak could have had his life spared, but he didn't want the boys, he didn't want the children to be afraid. He knew where they were going. He knew what was going to happen to them. And on August 5th, 1942, accompanied by 196 of these Jewish children, he went with them to the trains, and onwards to the gas chamber at Treblinka, where he died along with these children. A great hero, not just in terms of Holocaust history, is also viewed in a very honorable fashion by the nation of Poland. 
the most moving place of all and the most extraordinary place I've ever been, have anything to do with the Holocaust, have anything to do with history, is the Children's Memorial here at Yad Vashem. I can't talk about it long because it's, I can only go so far. I used to be able to do in Holocaust classes, back before I had children of my own, I could go triple X rated in terms of these crimes that were committed. I can't do it anymore. And in this case, what you do is you walk in to this memorial on the grounds. And in this memorial, it is recognizing the 1.5 million children who were shot, who were gassed, who were beaten to death, who were starved to death, who had bizarre and cruel medical experiments performed upon them. And when you walk into this room, in my opinion, the most fantastic experience of all in terms of the tragedy and the sadness and the horror of this all, there's a voice that you hear saying the name, the age, and the country of origin of each of these individuals going on continually. Absolutely unforgettable. This was designed as was the museum itself by Moshe Safdie. If history teaches us anything is that it is the following. There is but one race, the human race. And we learn unfortunately nothing for the mass murder of the European Jews. World War I you have the Turks attacking the Armenians, the Khmer Rouge, and Pol Pot in Cambodia in 1970s in the killing fields, ethnic cleansing in Yugoslavia, Darfur, ISIS and the Yazidis attacking the Yazidis in the present day as we speak. But what I think is most pertinent is in the words of the Holocaust historian Raoul Hilbert the much larger picture and what ultimately all of this means. For as long as a group of people are not fully accepted into a society, they walk a tightrope between acceptance and annihilation. Thank you very much. We thank you, Dr. Crane, for such a great presentation concerning the Holocaust Museum that's in Jerusalem. And with that, we understand again our responsibility to teach the love for one another that comes from Jesus in the Gospels and also in the letters of Paul. And with that, we bring to a close this presentation. And so may the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he look upon you with kindness and give you shalom. My father taught me a lot about life without ever saying a word. When I was a little girl, my friends were all just like me. His never were. Hello, hello. Uh, didn't you bring them, George? I thought you were No, no, I brought them last time. Huh? You're all right. <laughs> I forgot. All right, so All right. we'll be with I used to wonder, why would a Jew, a Christian, and a Muslim ever get together? It was him! And then I finally got it. They had a lot more in common than donuts. Friendship. Pass it on. A message from the Foundation for a Better Life.